Hello, it's Tuesday, September the 15th, and welcome back to Goodfellows, a Hoover Institution broadcast examining the social, economic, political, and geopolitical implications of this time of pandemic. I'm Bill Whalen. I'm a research fellow here at the Hoover Institution, the Virginia Hobbs Carpenter Fellow in Journalism. It's my great honor to be the moderator of today's show. Now, as this is the Ides of September, this marks the sixth month that we've been doing Goodfellows. And those of you who've been with us from the beginning, we appreciate your loyalty. But those of you who are tuning in for the first time, what you're about to see for the better part of the next hour is a frank conversation between three Hoover Institution senior fellows, or good fellows as we like to jokingly call them, but three senior fellows having a conversation, offering their insights as to what may lie ahead in these uncertain times. Now let's meet the good fellows, beginning with John Cochran. He's an economist and the Rosemary and Jack Anderson senior fellow here at the Hoover Institution. How goes it, John? I'm smoky. Smoky. You're in Palo Alto? I am in Palo Alto, yes. Okay. <clears throat> Breathe carefully, my friend. We're also joined by Neil Ferguson from his undisclosed location, his wilderness fortress somewhere out in the great beyond. Neil, of course, is a renowned historian and author. He is also the Milbank Family Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution. Neil, how are things? Not as smoky as they are with uh, John, who sounds remarkably like Gavin Newsom in terms of uh, hoarseness. But we are actually getting uh, quite a bit of haze here uh, and uh, it's uh, it's clearly small particles of ash. I hope not from my home uh, in California, but uh, that's obviously the worry. Okay, well, stay safe, my friend. So we're fortunate to be joined by Victor Davis Hansen, who is the Martin and Ely Anderson Senior Fellow here at the Hoover Institution. How are you, Victor? Very good. Now, we're going to talk about California, Victor, today, and that's why we're glad to have you on the show, because whereas Neil, John, and I are California transplants, you are the fifth successive generation to live in the same house on your family's farm outside of Fresno. So while we're transplants, you are firmly rooted in the California soil. And I thought we'd start the show today with you giving us a personal story, and that is what has happened to your cabin up in the lake up in the mountains. Well, uh, Huntington Lake was part of the Big Creek project that Henry Huntington created in 1911 to 13 to provide LA with half its power. It was the first electrical transmission project in the country. And he, he built this beautiful lake. It's an alpine lake. It's very rare because it has winds like Tahoe and it's high up. And it's been the kind of a regatta mecca of Californians from the Bay Area. And uh, there's 400 cabins that, cir- that make a circle around it. And they've been there since 1912. And it was thought that the atmospherics and the fact that it was near the water and there was access meant it would never burn down. And in fact, it never has. When this thing happened, the wind came in uh, from the West and devoured, it it literally traveled 20 miles a day. The fire then went contrary to expectation. The wind shifted and it went West and it got around the lake and it just devoured those cabins. There's a few that survived for idiosyncratic reasons. And then when it came up to the historic hotel where we were, uh, there were about 12 of us with homes and some condominiums. They decided that they could save it. So they went back in, they had evacuated, and they got some heroic bulldozer drivers that made a really wide swath. And they made sort of an Alamo-like fortress. And then for three days, they put out embers that came over the top, and they declared it uh, about 48 hours ago saved. But until then, I had been told every day it was lost. And then a guy that I knew would take, who was fighting the fires would take a picture and send it to me. He said, no, you're not. And then the next day, somebody would say, yes, it is. And I'd already talked to the insurance person, and uh, it, was, it was bleak, so we're... I'm happy that I saved mine, but as I said, these beautiful homes that have been in families for three or four or five generations are gone. So that's a, there's a lot to process here when it comes to California fires, the climate, forests, and land management. Why don't we begin uh, by looking at this clip uh, from Gavin Newsom, Governor Newsom, the other day uh, as he was uh, uh, touring some uh, devastation. What we're experiencing right here is coming to a community all across the United States of America unless we get our act together on climate change, unless we disabuse ourselves of all the BS that's being spewed by a very small group of people that have an ideological reason to advance the cause of a 19th century framework and solution. We're not going back to the 19th century. We're not apologists to that status quo. We believe in the fresh air of progress versus the stale air 
emphasis, stale air of normal. Okay, so I'd like the three of you to explain to me what is the fresh air of progress versus stale air of normalcy? I don't know. Best spoke Zarathustra, I guess, but he, uh, his problem is I would love to go back to a 19th century policy of fighting fires and preventing them, cleaning up the forest, cutting down dead trees, hauling out brush, allowing cattle to graze down sage and grasses, because I, I lived up and I grew up in that period. And he thinks that we didn't have droughts. I lived through the 76, the 57 drought. We had terrible forest fires when I was growing up. There was a difference. And that is when the moment that spark lit, people rushed up there and they knew exactly where to go because they had spent most of their summers cleaning up the forest. So they knew there were trails that were accessible, there were roads, and it was a collective action. And when this thing kept going under Jerry Brown and his leadership, we said, this is a time bomb. And uh, he can say all he wants about climate change, but we had droughts before and the collective temperature of California to what we know over the last century is about a degree higher. And it's in a, we can argue about that. I don't want to argue about that, but I can tell you that forest, forest policy is radically different than it was just 30 years ago. Let me jump in here a little bit. I mean, I've been uh, blogging a little about this and I'm really shocked. There was also the, the news conference with uh, President Trump and, and the Californians. Um, if you take all the climate change stuff that you hear, what it says is California is warmer. Let's not argue whether that's uh, good or bad for forest fires, but every scientific climate change thing says it's gonna keep getting warmer. And if you enact the full Green New Deal, it's still gonna keep getting warmer, just a little bit less warmer. So it, the, the enlisting of this into the cause of climate change is just a profound ignorance of, willful ignorance of cause and effect. If you do the full Green New Deal, it will not be for a hundred years that the climate cools back to what it was in the 1980s and taking for granted their views on climate. Their views on climate say it's hundreds of years before their climate policies would do anything about this. Um, so if you believe in the climate change and that the climate change is making wildfires worse, which is arguable, but if you believe in that, it should even more strongly say, we must clean up the forest, we must adapt, we must mitigate, we must do something about this tremendous problem, not just a property, but to human health. The air quality here is worse than Beijing. The air quality is worse than the 1960s, which caused all of the, all the, the entire EPA to be formed. It's absolutely ridiculous, but uh, it's interesting that it's on both sides. I was interested that President Trump went back to, oh no, climate change isn't real, undermining his own purpose. His point was we need to clean up the forest. Well, if climate change is real and causing this, then ever more reason you should clean up the forest. There is a little bit of common sense erupting. Uh, the New Yorker uh, wrote an article about forest management uh, reporting on uh, what, the, uh, what the Forest Service has been experimenting with and realizing in their uh, research uh, stations that the natural state of the Sierra has much less trees and brushes on it both due, to, both due to grazing and due to um, more frequent smaller burning and that our forests are very unhealthy. So this view is slowly coming out. There is some hope for it. Uh, and it's funny that it's from the left that in order to dragoon this into the service of a climate change agenda that has nothing to do with the fires, they're kind of insisting on making the fires worse. I wonder if I could come in here. I went back and uh, looked at that clip from Gavin Newsom uh, that you played a moment ago. And uh, there was one part of it that I agreed with. Uh, the sentence before the part that you played goes like this. California, folks, is America fast forward. What we're experiencing right here is coming to a community all across the United States of America, unless we get our act together. And I wish you'd just stopped there uh, before going on to talk about climate change, because if he'd just stopped there, I would have agreed with him. Unfortunately, what we see in California, not just the wildfires, but a whole litany of examples of poor governance, uh, a litany that Victor has brilliantly spelled out in multiple articles, is indeed coming to the United States as a whole, and it could be coming as soon as January if the Democrats uh, win this upcoming election. 
I came to California uh, in good faith uh, four years ago, uh, really unaware, I think it's fair to say, of the, the, the problems that the state faced. I only really began to uh, understand, uh, not just when I started reading Victor on California, but when I started interacting with the California uh, state authorities and indeed with local authorities. And I encountered a, a regulatory state that makes France look like Milton Friedman's utopia. I was shocked to find that California was far worse governed than Massachusetts. Naively, I had just thought uh, moving from Harvard to Stanford would be like moving, uh, you know, from a snowy, of a snowy place to a sunny place. It'll be the same basic story. But actually, California's far worse governed, far uh, worse so, governed so than Massachusetts. How and so. what terrifies me is that ultimately, uh, the Democratic Party have admitted that they're going to turn the whole country into California by putting Kamala Harris on the ticket uh, alongside an extremely elderly man who doesn't seem to me likely to go the distance of a four-year term. So we're, we're going to get this, not just wildfires. I'm sure those are going to happen in other states. They're already happening in other states, of course. They're in some ways even worse in Oregon. What really depresses me is the prospect that the whole range of dysfunction that one encounters in California is going to become the national standard. The excessive taxation is going to become the national standard. The excessive and dysfunctional regulation is going to become the national standard. The terrible education that makes Californian public schools so dreadful is going to become the national standard. So I'm afraid smoke in the air could be the least of our worries a year from now. We could find the entire country heading down California's path. And, and that's the part of Gavin Newsom's hoarse utterance that I agreed with. Yeah, I think you're right. It reminds me of Tacitus' remark by the British tribal chief of, of the Romans. They make it a they uh, make a desert and they call it peace. They've destroyed California and they call it the wave of the future. So they're very proud of this, and uh, we're losing. We have about two percent of the the state. And I think Bill and I have talked about this. That pay fifty percent of the state income tax. If you, it doesn't matter what Neil, you or I said. Uh, when I was writing an article the other day, I went to the Fresno U-Haul because I'd heard all these rumors. And I said, I want to go to Austin, Texas, or Elko, Nevada, or Boise, Idaho, and they gave me the rates for a, a, a van. And I said, you can't believe it. Twelve hundred dollars, fourteen hundred. What if I want to fly there and come back? And they said, we'll do it for free. If you're over there and you want to bring these things back, free. I said, what Fresno. Anybody who wants to come in. Look, one other thing that, that we have a, a couple of other things too. Uh, we have a one party state, and I see in some of this an effort to export that as well. Uh, the one party state is partly enforced by when you have a strong regulatory state, you trade political favor for regulatory exemption. Everything in California is done by exemption. Uh, and uh, how do you get an exemption? You have to go ask, please. Um, we also have, uh, they kind of have to do this because everyone's moving out. Uh, I know lots of young tech people who are moving out of San Francisco and they report that the moving vans are lined up up and down the roads. Uh, you got to take over the country because it's much harder to move out of the country than it is to move out of San Francisco. The interesting that things that's going to happen, I've, I've noticed this in other places, the, the parade of Priuses is leaving San Francisco uh, with the moving trucks behind and they bring their voting habits with them. So there's a certain slash and burn politics to this <laughs> as well. Uh, so taking over the country is is uh, possibly the only way they can keep it going. Well, yeah. not everyone is leaving California. San Francisco, for example, if you try to buy a house in Sacramento right now, good luck. People in the Bay Area are flooding that area and buying overpriced. But here's a question for you, gentlemen. I moved to California in 1994 to work for a governor. I wrote speeches for him. And a feature of every speech he gave in 1994 running for re-election was the economy was so bad at one point, U-Haul could not keep up with the demand. They ran out of U-Hauls in California, one-way trips elsewhere. Uh, we have wildfires every year in California. We complain about taxes every year in California. There's a lot about the current complaining about California that I've seen going on for 25 years now. So other than the orange skies, what is it really different in 2020 compared to past years where California has faced recessions, has faced questions about how to rebuild and reemerge. Well, let's go a bit further back than you just did, 
bill, because I think it's important to have some historical perspective here. The Republican candidate for the presidency won California in every election but one, that was 64, between 1952 and 1988. Uh, As far as I can see, it's only in relatively recent times that the Democrats have established a kind of blue monopoly on politics in California, that they've won every election since uh, 88, uh, at least the president uh, Uh, the presidential candidate of the Democrats has won California in every election since then. And the share of the vote going to the Democratic candidate has risen. But from 46% to 62% four years ago, uh, the Democrats have now a massive majority in the California state legislature of the assembly, but it's much larger than it used to be. It's 61 now, it was 48 and 92. So I think part of the puzzle here that one needs to address, and I'd love to get Victor's thoughts on this, is why did the Republicans lose California and lose it so completely that it feels pointless even voting in California uh, in in this election? Uh, I'm kind of wondering whatever happened to Reagan's California, and I wish I'd been more aware of how completely dead it was when I packed up uh, and sent the U-Haul uh, across the country from uh, from Cambridge. I, I really underestimated the extent to which I was moving to a one-party state. Remember, there are still Republicans in politics in Massachusetts, even have a governor uh, who's uh, a Republican. And that kind of thing just seems unimaginable in the California of today. It certainly wasn't unimaginable in the 1980s. Uh, what went wrong, Victor? Uh, well, there was a tripart uh, perfect storm. Number one, and this is disputed, in the last 30 years, some six to 10 million people left. And these were the voters that were the base of, over the last half century, we wouldn't believe it, but we had 32 years of Republican governance. That was, that was Ronald Reagan, George Zygmajian, Pete Wilson, Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that constituency decided that not only was it too regulated, the taxes were too high, but what you got for your money was very bad. The schools were bad, the infrastructure, and more importantly, they, they felt they were insulted as if they owed the, they, they had to owe the government. So they left and they left for Nevada and Florida and Texas and Boise. And then the second thing was we had the largest concentration of wealth in the history of civilization. As you know, Neil, you've written about it in Silicon Valley. I think the market capitalization of Yahoo and Apple and Google uh, and the other company is somewhere around, um, what, $4 trillion. And that gave an enormous amount of money. And with that money came political power. And so in every one of these statewide races, and you're right, there's not one statewide office holder is Republican, super majorities in both legislatures, seven of 53 congressional districts, uh, Republican now. But in every race, the Democrats outspent the Republicans. That hadn't been true before, but they drew on that huge amount of money and that coastal that coastal nexus. If you're at Caltech or Stanford or UCLA or Berkeley, those experts that, that told us about whether it was climate change or forest policy came out of those now global, very wealthy universities and, uh, and hoping that somebody uh, can really make the argument that the Democratic Party is not the party of the working person. It's the party of the very wealthy and the very poor, and it's got enormous amounts of capital to uh, to affect the election. Go ahead, John. I, I want to jump in and disagree here, uh, and, yeah. and I got to channel HR, who's our, our resident optimist, and, and without him around, this tends to devolve into grumpiness. When you're in a one party, I come from a one party state, the city of Chicago, and that doesn't mean politics is over. That just means it happens within the party. Uh, the Democratic primary is where all the issues get sorted out. And there are cleavages within uh, California as well. There is a little bit of common sense coming out. Uh, Brown recognized that overtaxing rich people leads them to leave the state. Uh, Newsom has recognized that maybe having the power go off isn't such a good thing, and we should bring back online some of those gas power generators. Uh, there is, you know, as we were talking before, there is even within the very liberal science community a consensus that we got to do something about the forests. Um, within um, the politics, there is a YIMBY movement in San Francisco that has recognized how the incredible damage that our real estate regulation is doing and that we just need to build more houses, not government provided affordable housing and so forth, just more houses. Among other things, the zoning restrictions is part of what's driving people to build houses out where the forest fires are. I mean, these things interact. 
Um, and there is even within politics, uh, George Schultz hosted a very interesting uh, uh, discussion last week where I learned about the mob. Turns out within Sacramento party politics, there is a group of people who call themselves the mob. I don't know what stands for it. I need to learn. But this is Latino, African-American um, uh, Democrats, but Democratic politicians who are concerned exactly about the issues you mentioned. The schools are awful. Our kids need jobs. We need cops to come keep the peace around here. We need power that works, water that works, air that is clean. Uh, within the, the Democratic Party is not the Chinese Communist Party. It is right now tearing itself apart, as we see, between the, the progressives and the practical. And there is uh, sort of the, the, the Democrats that we used to like to gently debate with 20 years ago are still around. <laughs> they have the practical end. So it's not as monolithic as it sounds. It just uh, doesn't belong Democrat, Republican. So, so John, John, what he is referring to is the mod squad, the moderate Democrats. Mod, not mod, the caucus, mod. But the, uh, yeah, yeah, mob is the other lot, I think, John. Uh, uh, if they don't call themselves the mob, they really should. Neil, I'd like to read you something that Jerry Brown said the other day and get your thoughts on this. Jerry Brown said, quote, tell me, this is the New York Times, quote, tell me, where are you going to go? What's your alternative? Maybe Canada? You're going to go to places like Iowa where they have intensifying tornadoes? The fact is we have a global crisis that has been mounting and the scientists have been telling us about. For the most part, it's been ignored. Now we have a graphic example. The former governor does raise a point, Neil. If you want to do technology, if you want to do biotech, if you want to do entertainment, if you want to be like Victor and put your hands in the soil and actually grow something for people, where else would you want to be but California? This is um, a rather a weak argument. Uh, reading up on this uh, problem of wildfires, I came across uh, a remarkable statistic uh, from Nature Sustainability. Uh, which uh, said California would need to burn 20 million acres, which is about the size of Maine, talking of other states, to restabilize itself in terms of fire. We actually had gone down to 13,000 acres uh, a year between 99 and 2017. Uh, I don't think there are many places in the world that are quite as combustible as California right now. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that if the fire season is going to become a regular feature of the months August, September, October, and possibly November, I am not going to stay. I'm the most pessimistic person on this uh, show today because Victor plans to stay. But I don't see any way that I, an asthmatic uh, with two small children, could possibly uh, live uh, with that kind of uh, air quality, uh, mm -hmm. two or three months a year, not to mention the risk of our house actually being burnt down. So I don't think California is fixable because you can't burn that much. There isn't a way of getting to stability now. It's too screwed up. And I think the exodus uh, is still at a relatively early stage. Uh, where I'm located right now, uh, the number of Californians showing up in search of real estate is one of the talking points uh, of the summer. Uh, people are not going to stick around with Jerry Brown saying, oh, it would be worse in Iowa, because it clearly wouldn't be worse in Iowa. It clearly wouldn't be worse uh, where I am. I don't think it would be worse in the Northeast. Actually, there's a re really fascinating article that ProPublica just uh, put out showing uh, that if we accept the uh, negative scenario of global warming and climate change, there is going to be mass migration all over the world. I think I mentioned in a previous show the vast uh, uh, exodus from uh, North Africa towards Europe that lies ahead. You ain't seen nothing yet. But clearly in the United States, people are going to move. They're going to move from the south uh, where it's becoming intolerably humid and where there are clearly going to be all kinds of problems along the coastline of Florida, and they're going to leave California. And California has screwed it up, I think, irreparably. It's tragic. Uh, I've really loved the four years I've spent here, but the way things are going, I can't imagine a long-term future for me and my family here. I think we'd be mad to stick around. I, I want to disagree. I'd like just to add, if I could just add something. What works in California was the legacy of the dead. And by that, I mean the JC, CSU, UC, tripartite was created by brilliant people who are dead. The California Water Project and the Central Valley Project keep the state alive. We haven't built a major non-LA reservoir since 1983. The dead keep us alive. If we didn't have that, we wouldn't exist. St Silicon Valley was created by brilliant people that worked in a different climate, and it was the nexus of Stanford and UC Berkeley. What I'm getting at is what 
the freeway system, the cloverleaf, all that was invented in California. I can remember when LAX was considered the model airport in the United States. What I'm getting at is we are living on the fumes of people who are dead. And for Jerry Brown to say, well, they're all coming here. Well, they're all coming here because we haven't quite ruined that. If I'm looking out the window and I see this beautiful checkerboard, if I could see it without the smog, all of the irrigation system, all of the technology was created in a different climate. We're sort of like Greeks walking around looking at the remains of, in the Roman times, of the remains of the Acropolis and wondering how beautiful it is. But we don't have the willpower or the skill to, to do that anymore. As far as uh, what you said, John, it's not so much, I wouldn't call it politics that people are, it's what Herb Stein and the Nixon administration once said, what can't go on, won't go on. And so there are people in the Democratic Party who say, whatever we're doing, it's hurting me now. It's hurting my kids. If I'm for open borders in Fresno, and most are, my kids are being threatened by M13 people because they don't speak Spanish, even though they're Mexican-American. Or if I don't believe, I believe in high-speed rail, but my cousin got killed on the 99-year Tulare. So they understand that, and they're trying to figure it out. But that, and that's going to be good in the long term, but that's not going to bring back the five natural gas generation plants that, that the Democrats shut down or the nuclear plant they shut down or Diablo Canyon they're going to shut down. It's not going to build any tem, uh, temperance flat or the Sykes Reservoir. We're not going to get 12 million uh, acre feet of water storage that supplies, by the way, the Bay Area and the California Water Project, San Jose. It's just not going to happen. It, I, I understand that people, uh, you know, that, that have their way and they, they have their ideology and now they're saying, you know what, I, had, I thought that I was going to be exempt from the ramifications of what I advocated for others. But suddenly, this monster I created is biting me and therefore, what are we going to do? That's not the same as a different ideological view that says, I want to respect private property. I don't want to have one rules for uh, people who pay taxes and re regulate the hell out of them and give exemption for people who can't. It's, it's not solidified or articulated in a political party in Republican or conservative terms. It's just people are pissed off because they created anarchy and they don't know what to do about it and they want to do something about it. But when you actually talk to them and say, this is how it used to work and this is what it would take, no, it's not going to happen. So I think it's worth bringing up the point about Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley can move and I think it is moving. Uh, one of the most striking uh, phenomena of 2020 has been the realization that you can run big tech companies remotely, uh, that they actually don't need to be uh, located geographically in Silicon Valley anymore. Uh, I was having a conversation with one of the most uh, influential and successful tech CEOs uh, in California uh, just a few days ago, and uh, he startled me by saying that they, uh, they themselves have been surprised at how ready their engineers are to continue working from home and to get out of California. Uh, and he himself is getting out of California and has already left. So if the big tech companies leave, Victor, who's left to pay the taxes? There isn't gonna be anybody. And your analogy with the dark ages, which I think is appropriate, uh, think of all those people in Britain too, wandering around marveling at the Roman architecture, but completely incapable of replicating it. Well, that's going to be California. Uh, it's not going to be fixable uh, any more than you can uh, replicate the uh, the Roman Empire in the Dark Ages. So Neil raises a good point here, which is that if you go back to the 1990s, John, I'll bring you here. Uh, you go back to the 1990s, the aerospace sector collapses in Southern California. That was Victor's reference to the Republicans who left the state. They were mostly Republican-leaning voters. But the California economy reemerged re in the second half of that decade based on trade, based on tourism, agriculture, and technology. So the question, gentlemen, is if this California economy is going to reinvent itself given COVID and given now the, the climate situation, what do you see happening, John? Well, I'm even more pessimistic than my fellows here, not because of the fires, uh, the, the fires, you know, they could be fixed. For the $80 billion we're going to spend on high-speed rail, you could just send, you could go clear out the fires. We got a lot of unemployed people. Uh, we can go cl clear out the underbrush in a year and the fire problem would be over. It, it's not going to happen, but it could happen. Um, and yes, uh, uh, um, Victor's right to point to the institutions, the, the arches that we admire, even though we've forgotten the recipe for concrete. 
Um, but as an economist, I, I see an even greater danger. Uh, when we think of the e economics of cities, uh, I think the, the case is not so much the Roman Empire, but Detroit. Detroit in 1920s was the hoppinest place in the country. It was, of course, where the auto industry was. And there was lots of small auto industries, lots of startups. And as economists look at it, there's, there's something about an area like Silicon Valley, like Detroit, where there's an agglomeration, where if you're going to start something new, you had to do it in the Silicon Valley, even though the houses cost $3 million, even though the regulatory and tax situation was awful, you had to be here. Why? Because uh, if you're starting a new company and you need someone who knows how to do JavaScript, interacted with something else, bing, he's there. The money was here. The venture capitalists who knew how to evaluate new companies and get them going was here. But you only do here what you absolutely have to do here. And that was the startup thing uh, centered around the institution of Stanford, uh, of, U of the University of California, of the defense industries. That provoked, that was the nexus that brought this expertise here. The money came here and we had this thing like Detroit in the 1920s where you had to be here to do the startup, to do the first phase. But the companies move out as fast as they can. Once you're doing operations, once you're a big established company and your business model is you hire people and they stay with you for a long time and you're in Washington get uh, lobbying for exemptions to this, that, and the other thing, you have a global footprint, you're in the production mode, then you move out as fast as they can. And the, the tech companies have already been doing this. Only the part that's the startup, the innovative, the new stuff that absolutely had to be done here was done here. Well, tech companies are now big tech companies. They're big established kind of regulated monopoly tech companies. They're, you know, where does Oracle get its new ideas from? From buying TikTok, not from some new startup in the Silicon Valley. And so that, that, that agglomerate, it produced tremendous wealth while it had to be done here. It le leads to the rental, the, the, the rent seeking classes, the government charges immense taxes, puts into place bureaucracies, puts into place public employee unions and slowly kills the whole thing. That's what happened to Detroit. And unfortunately, as someone whose entire wealth is invested in California real estate, <laughs> that is uh, you know, what, what the economics of it say is almost sure to happen to California. What is, this, you, you used to move to the Bay Area and you were 10 times as productive as you were in Iowa or in Austin, Texas or in Denver. That's not true anymore. That special sauce of agglomeration of interaction uh, just, isn't now, just isn't here anymore and it's, it's moving out. So what will save California? Only if it becomes a reasonable place to do business, revitalizes its public institutions, not just the, the physical infrastructure, but also the intellectual infrastructure. You know, Santa Clara County is trying to get rid of Stanford as fast as it can, whereas everybody else in the country is trying to create a new Silicon Valley here. Uh, and the chances of that happening? Nah, I, I see them, you know, living off the- a Hypothesis for you, gentlemen. California has become a Latin American country. Discuss. Yeah. Well, the back, the flip side. American big city. It's become Detroit, Chicago, Rochester, New York, uh, a, a, uh, a rotten political system with living off the dregs of what once was there until it all falls apart. But, but Victor, Victor wrote a piece in which he very shrewdly observed that rural California starts to look a lot like Latin America or the Caribbean. And I want to I hear a bit more about that because I think there's a great deal of truth in it, though doubtless it's not a very woke thing to say. But I would say uh, the flip side of what John said is that people not only came here because you needed a face-to-face -face society for Silicon Valley at one time, and you don't, so that many of them will leave, but they also like what they call the California ambience. I'll give you an example. I was watching Vertigo the other day, Alfred Hitch, 58, I think. So that's 60 years ago, and they have live shots of the streets of San Francisco. These are not staged. The people are well-dressed, they're multiracial even, but it's a clean city. There's not thousands of homelessness. I don't, they didn't go to the, the Fairmont in those days and have the footmen say, show me your sneakers on the bottom so I can see if you have needle fragments or human feces as they do today. They didn't, when I used to go to Stanford University as a student in 1975, I would leave this farm and I got there in two hours and 45 minutes. I'd leave any time I wanted. If I want to go there today, it's a six-hour drive, and it's a nightmare. And what I'm getting at is, if you wanted to go from the Bay Area to Carmel, they just hopped in the car, and you were there in an hour and a half. It can be four or five hours on a weekend. But what I'm saying is the infrastructure is so decrepit 
and the cities are so unattractive that people are starting to say, if the business rationale is to leave, there's no countervailing cultural or aesthetic or human argument against that. Whereas in the past, there might have been. If we had a 1970s California that was still working and we had Zoom, I think people would stay. But now this becomes the final argument why you can leave. And it's very dangerous because uh, I'm writing a book on citizenship and you don't know how many people are writing things that they want people to leave. They say, you know what? This is part of the new exciting diversity that we're seeing. This is part of the new mosaic. And that the more that we get rid of these uh, Neanderthal dinosaurs, the better. Neil mentioned rural California. I'm looking right out here. And what I do every weekend, I get in the truck and I go up and down the road by my farm and I pick up diapers and I pick up garbage. And then I take our dogs and we walk this way. And in the last six months, I found two people shooting up heroin in the orchard. I found a semi truck on blocks. How do you put a whole semi truck on blocks? I've come across a spray rig and seen people in the act of stripping a spray rig for what? Poison? And that's a nightly occurrence. And the rule is if you have somebody come out from town, they dump their car seat and their TV, you've got to get that pile out in 24 hours because people go around the rural area, they talk to people and say, we, we can get your trash for you, don't pay the city anymore. They come out, they find a place, and they'll keep adding to it. And so that, that's chaos. And if I say to anybody, that's largely a phenomenon of illegal immigration, not legal immigration. People come from Mexico legally, they don't do that. People come from India, they don't do that. But li- illegal immigration, they do. Then you become socially or culturally ostracized and demonized. So, And one other final thing is that when I read all these virtue signaling uh, announcements from our colleagues at Stanford and higher education about they're shocked and that they do this and that. If you wanted to save California, then the worst thing, you, if you wanted to, and you think you were going to sacrifice as they say they are, then you would move, you would put your kid in the Fresno Unified Schools and you would get active in PTA and you would invite Jose Hernandez to come over to your house on weekends and then you would tutor some guy uh, in the inner city. And that would be a very dangerous, uh, problematic endeavor. And your kids, I put all three of my kids in the public school. And, and my biggest problem was, would they be able to fight well enough? Or would they able to withstand racism against them? And so nobody wants to do that. And so as a psychological medieval mechanism, what they do is they think, you know, I live in this nice neighborhood and my kids are in private school. And I don't, I know uh, her, Linda, she does my, you know, dishes and my lawn. I feel so bad about this and my white privilege. So I'm going to create a superstructure where I'm going to condemn all of these deplorables and irredeemables and white fragility. And then that somehow squares a circle as if I'm in, you know, the 15th century and I'm buying a dome on a cathedral to get rid of all my sins. And that's what is sick about this country. We saw it after George Floyd. We had all of these very wealthy white left-wing people who were falling all over themselves to condemn all of these people who had no white privilege at all. Go to Southern Michigan. I was there the last two weeks. Some of the poorest people in the world. And they have white privilege. The people who said they did had it. And they said that because they know deep down inside they're not doing anything to uh, repair racial relationships or to create the melting pot again and probably doing a lot against it, and they don't want to do something. And so that, that's really hard to take. When Gavin Newsom says that, I would, when he said that from the clip, I said, why don't you just pay your taxes? That's all you got to do. <laughs> hey, so, Vic, so, Vic, so Victor had a solution in there. Victor's solution was to put kids in different schools and show kids how the other half lives. seems to me we have one or two choices here. There's either leave the state, hashtag Neil exit, or stay in the state and try to fix things. So, gentlemen, we only have about 10 minutes left in this broadcast. How do we fix things? How do you fix well, the, listen here. How do you fix listen the here. My parents had taken that philosophy and put me into a comprehensive school in Glasgow. I would not be here. So forget about that. I'm not doing that that's to my kids any more not. than my mother and father would have done it to me because that's not actually, it's not actually viable. It's not right. a way that's going to solve the problem uh, right. other than maybe to give your kids an incredibly hard childhood. No, forget it. I mean, vote with your feet. As, if you can't get your vote to matter democratically and clearly in California, you can't. 
the only rational strategy is to vote with your feet. And that's what people are going to do until ultimately it reaches such a, a nadir uh, that change is, is forced upon both uh, the mod and the mob factions within the Democratic Party. But that probably involves far worse wildfires than we've yet seen and even more uh, collapsing infrastructure and even more uh, flight. So I just, it seems to me that sticking around waiting for the Democrats to get it into their heads that there's something fundamentally and pathologically wrong with what they're doing is not a rational strategy for anybody who cares about uh, his children. And this is what we've seen in Latin America that came up in Detroit, uh, in dying cities everywhere. Even when people recognize what needs to be done, there are enough people feeding off the carcass that getting the political will, just, it's just very simple. Uh, basic governance. The streets have to be safe. The schools have to work somewhat fundamentally well. The power has to stay on. The air has to be roughly clean. You have to be able to get a building permit in under five years. It's not that hard, but uh, there's so much entrenched interest feeding off the, the, the carcass of what's left that uh, getting those simple things to happen is very, very hard. I think that's a very good metaphor. And it's what I meant, what, what can't go on, won't go on. But this is a carcass and you're right, there's people that are eating it and they're so hungry and they, they eat so well that they're oblivious that the carcass is rotting and it's not gonna feed them in 20 years, but they feel either that they'll be dead or they'll find a way as they have in the past to navigate around the disaster they created. And, and if I may, it's, it's not as easy as just slightly fixing things. The way the great wealth gets created is this agglomeration, this, oh, let's all go to Silicon Valley and we'll do something new. Uh, let's not forget the lesson of all the hundreds of towns that are trying to create their own Silicon Valleys is that it's very hard to do. You need that special spark that moves everybody there. Once they've left, uh, you know, maybe you can go become what Iowa is today, you know, faintly reasonably govern small towns, but bringing back that enormous wealth once the golden goose has picked up and left and, and all her little goslings have left too is hard. The, the one thing that we do know though, you know, ask people in Austin, Texas, the Californians come in and they bring their guilt and their voting patterns with them. So <laughs> this fire can spread. Yeah. Well, I think you've got a good point about when people leave. The town that I'm looking at over this way is was a racially diverse, multiracial society of about 7,000 people, Greeks, Mexican-Americans, Portuguese, Armenians. The so-called European population was probably no more than 40%, but it was a very successful community. Now it's about 90% Hispanic, and I, I would imagine without documentation, 40% of the people are so-called undocumented, and everybody's left. I don't mean white people left. I'm talking about Japanese Americans, everybody, because if you go into town, nothing works. The, the street lights have been stripped, and if you go into certain stores, they don't speak English, so it works for them, but it doesn't work for others. Uh, ordinances are not followed. We had an epidemic of uh, missing manhole covers, because some people within the city workforce were stealing them to melt down. All the copper wire was stolen for out of the lights. That's been, the sheriff's finally got tough on that. And I can remember there was a beautiful women's Christian temperance fountain that was, and it was torn down. The city had to widen the street, so-called street widening. And then they put in an Aztec totem there, which glorifies their severed heads on top of the totem, the goddess of the moon, 30,000 human sacrifices a day. Let me, let me interrupt just a second, Victor. So I want to put in a marker that we'll come back sometime and talk about immigration, because I think you're being very simplistic about illegal immigration. No, I'm not talking about immigration. I'm not talking about immigration. I'm not talking about people being horrible and needs reform, but not just seal the borders is the answer to our problem. No, I'm I'm not not that is a marker. That I didn't want to let you get you completely off uh, uh, with scot free on the immigration question. And we'll I, was commenting, I was commenting on your your statement that what happens to a community when people were essential and left it for whatever reason. So I'm just saying that these were the symptoms, and I'm not saying they just left because of illegal immigration. I'm saying that they left because a lot of the industry and the canneries and the the forklift companies were outsourced. A Fruhoff trailer shut down, they outsourced to different countries. So it was a hollowing out of the industrial core here, maybe whose fault, I don't know. It was a problem of illegal immigration, it was a problem of the school system. But my point was, 
when people with set with certain skills who built the community and they invested in it, when they left in mass and they left within 20 years, and you can't find them today. I had yeah, that's the spiral people. that we're in danger of. The, the skill leaves, the tax base leaves, then the city, which is already, San Francisco spends $300,000 a year per homeless person. Uh, then the city cannot afford its pensions. It can't afford its cops. It can't afford to clean up the streets. Uh, New York has just cut its uh, its trash collection budget. And then things, and then more people leave and the whole thing spirals out of control. So I'm entirely with you that the people leaving spiral uh, and then, then all the infrastructure gets worse is exactly what's to worry about. I just wanted to, you've been blaming a lot on illegal immigration and, and we need to come back to well, that. I, I do. One, one little footnote to add to that, you John, is, is- on two things, legal immigration, which is measured, bureaucratic, diverse, and legal, versus illegal immigration, which is usually not diverse, non-meritocratic, and, break, and a person, the first thing a person does when he crosses the border is an, an act of illegality. The next thing is residing, which is another Ill, illegal act. And that becomes a pattern of thinking that he's exempt from federal and state laws. So but let's not forget, gentlemen. But not legal immigration. Let, legal let's, immigration not, let, 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 let's not forget in this part of the discussion, a point that Rehan Salam made in his recent book on uh, immigration reform, that for years, Republicans as well as Democrats turned a blind eye to illegal immigration because it, in fact, uh, provided a cheap labor supply that was irresistibly tempting. If well, one wants to kind of tease out the causation here, it's not all the Democrats' fault. Republicans were somewhat guilty of this too. The legal system's a disaster. Uh, you know, right now they've shut down H-1Bs, which is the one thing we can all agree on. If you are an entrepreneurial free market Republican who lives in Mexico City and you want to move to the U.S. to start a business and hire Americans, you can't do it. There's just no way to do it. So the problem is not just legal with this beautifully constructed law and then people who, who disobey it. The legal system is a complete disaster. Maybe we should come back and talk about this. I, I'm getting uh, signs that we only have five minutes left. <laughs> just you have only five minutes left. So gentlemen, I would, I'd like to ask you one final question here and then we'll, we'll sign off for today. Uh, California's fires have led to Donald Trump coming to California, which has led to a conversation about climate change. Are you a climate change believer, climate change skeptic, climate change denier? We're now going to have a huge media controversy over climate change. By my count, this is now the fourth big wave of media obsessions, if you want to call it that, this year. COVID, number one, social justice, number two, police brutality, number three, election craziness, election meltdowns, and now number four, climate change. Keeping in mind that Neil Ferguson is coming to us from a cabin with limited bandwidth, how much more bandwidth can we take in this election? Well, this, this one is just replaying the same old, same old talking points people have been playing for 20 years. Right. Uh, you know, believer or not believer in climate change, which is irrelevant. The question is, what economic policies have any cost benefit to doing this uh, versus not doing it? That's the real policy question. It's just turned into a virtue signal of which side you're on. So when you're tired of everything else, you go, oh, and what about climate change? Right. Uh, you know, what's coming up, which we've talked about before, is the absolute disaster of this election and what happens afterwards when it's com when it's undecisive. I think it's just it's lovely to see the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding together. I was worried earlier in the year that we were only going to have one of them, but it's clear that we'll have all we'll have all four by the time we get to by the time we get to election day. I think politically, uh, it's not a good issue for uh, President Trump the way the law and order issue. Uh, was and I, I think in the end, uh, it's not going to help him to get into the kind of argument that he's getting into. There's just a little bit too much in the way of extreme weather going on right now. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more hurricanes coming. It looks like uh, down in the uh, in the Atlantic. So my sense is that this is not good news for President Trump because despite all that we've said over the last 50 or so minutes, uh, I would say that there's a significant proportion of voters who are persuadable that the wildfires are due to climate change and the hurricanes are due to climate change. We're all agreed that that's a, an erroneous diagnosis, uh, but the way that the media overall currently play this issue, uh, I'm afraid it's, it's an issue that actually helps Joe Biden. I just want to jump in there quickly because wait, let me just jump in quickly because it's not that we think necessarily it's an erroneous issue. Even if they are due to climate change, 
what it means is you got to take seriously cleaning up the forests and raising the levees, not and not fighting about whether we should build high speed trains, which has nothing to do with solving the problems that were ahead of us. And I think what we may you, you asked what I had an idea, what will we be talking about? A debate's coming up. And I think we may be talking about the 25th Amendment and when that's going to get invoked after the, that debate is the big fun thing that may happen. I would just say in closing, Bill, that there were four issues. And I think most of us would agree that with the election held in January, Trump had a pretty good chance. I think he still does. But the issue was COVID, the first mass quarantine in our history, first self-induced recession where it wasn't caused by a real estate collapse or bank panic or Wall Street meltdown. It was self-induced. And then for whatever reasons, good or bad, and then the uh, series of deaths by in, while in police custody and, and the rioting and looting. And usually those would have been the source of acrimonious debates. And both candidates would be barnstorming, offering long-term issues and agendas that would frame those issues. That's not happening because we have a candidate in Joe Biden that's a Wizard of Oz candidate. Just like I'm speaking to you, that image on the screen is manipulated by a guy with hammer levers and gears. What I'm saying is he's being teleprompted. I'm serious. Teleprompted. The, the, the questions are scripted. It's not a normal campaign. It's a virtual campaign. And it's because his handlers have made a cost to benefit analysis that whatever downside they suffer by having exposed when he says thinking like bring the teleprompter closer or end of quotation when he actually reads the prompts on the screen, that outweighs the fact that like Admiral Jellico, who's Churchill said could end the only man that could lose the war in an afternoon. He's capable, if he goes out into a unscripted debate, of losing losing the election. I wish I wish Trump would stick to the teleprompter a little bit more yeah. often. Yeah, maybe he should. But my point is, so what happened? How did that happen? Biden is not out talking about or can talk about it. So what Trump is running against is Trump versus anti-Trump on COVID, Trump versus anti-economy, uh, Trump versus anti-quarantine, Trump versus anti-social uh, you know, justice or whatever. It, it's just whatever Trump is for, there's this you know, media, Democratic Party, but there's no positive counter agenda. And part of the reason is that that agenda in the Democratic primary, AOC's agenda and Bernie Sanders, was rejected by the majority of Democratic voters. They did not want Medicare for everybody. They did not want the New Green Deal. They did not want open borders. They did not want a wealth tax. And yet, because of this Faustian bar bargain, Biden became the nominee and had to accommodate that agenda. So he's been a, he's kind of a hostage. He can't say, I wanted to defund the police. I can't say, I don't want to defund the police. I, I deplore the violence, but I don't deplore the violence. So. This is a weird candidate. It's a virtual candidate, a virtual campaign, a virtual election, and Trump is running pretty much against himself. People are gonna vote for Trump because he's better than the alternative or they will vote for anything but Trump. Neil, the year just gets, Neil, Neil, the year just gets stranger and stranger, doesn't it? I could summarize that because I think it's a brilliant point. We have a year where there should be five really important public policy issues that we're talking about all the time, on top of the usual ones that we should be talking about. And yet we have essentially a policy free presidential election. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, final thoughts. I think perhaps it's worth observing and concluding. The surprising feature of recent polling is the shift of Hispanic uh, voters uh, to Trump. Uh, th this was a, a big uh, surprise from recent Florida polling. Trump had, poor, uh, had polled poorly in, in Florida for months. Uh, and the headline was uh, Trump loses seniors in Florida. But actually, if you read down, the real shocker was that you'd seen a swing of the Hispanic vote uh, from somewhere around the 30 percent mark to uh, to the high 40s. And I think that's that's potentially a really big story in this election, uh, that the more the Democratic Party has uh, gone down the the road of Black Lives Matter, uh, and uh, the more uh, the law and order issue has surfaced uh, uh, online as well as on cable news, the more uh, the Hispanic voters, 
those are of course the legal immigrants, have asked themselves if, if this really is the party they want to vote for November thir the 3rd. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm watching this one closely because it means that a bunch of states that we weren't paying much attention to may well be in play. And, uh, and we could be in for another surprise like the one of four years ago when uh, four years ago people weren't paying nearly enough attention to working class voters in states like Michigan. Uh, I feel the media are not paying nearly enough attention to Hispanic voters in Sunbelt states who are not happy. I okay, can and November the 3rd is just seven weeks away. And with that, we're going to wrap up this episode of Goodfellows. So, gentlemen, uh, enjoy the lively conversation. Victor, thanks for sitting in with us this week. We really enjoyed it and glad to hear your cabin was spared. Thank you. I appreciate it. See you guys. We'll be back next week with a new episode, a new conversation. On the behalf of the Goodfellows, Neil Ferguson, John Cochran, our special guest today, Victor Davis Hansen, all of us here at the Hoover Institution, by all means, stay safe, stay healthy, stay out of trouble. We'll do our best here at the Hoover Institution to help you stay informed. We'll see you next week. Thank you.